Well, we're going to be studying today the theme of the Devil's Dungeon, which is based on Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to be basically covering that whole chapter that talks about some of the last day events dealing with the millennium. But we were very interested to kind of get out on the streets and ask the average Americans, what do you think or what do you know about the millennium? So here's some of the responses that we received. What I think about when I hear about the millennium is all of the many times throughout my long life where people have thought that the millennium was coming and they were wrong. Satan would be bound into the bottom of the pit for 1,000 years. With the, why they call it millennia. It'll be peace on earth, the, the sheep will lay with the lamb, and there will be a lot of peace. But after he's let out of the ball in the pit, like I referred to earlier, then he's going to cause havoc again upon mankind and upon this earth. I believe that we uh, who have a relationship with Jesus will uh, be raptured. In other words, we'll be taken up with him. Um, and then after a thousand year reign, a millennium, then he will come back. What's the most important is humanity, like how we treat each other and what we're doing to, to be better people, not just to ourselves, but to others around us. I mean, I, I don't know any more than that. Well, in accordance to the book of Revelations, they said the thousand years is when Shaitan or Satan is going to be released to the earth. No, I'm not sure, but I think that last gentleman was videotaping our cameraman as they were videotaping him. So he could share the interview with his friends. A lot of different perspective, different uh, comments about the millennium. We're going to find out what the Word of God has to say. And before we even delve into the lesson, I'd like to just set the background by opening our Bibles together. Go to Revelation chapter 20. And I won't read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read the first segment of this. Revelation 20 verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or their hands, and they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And that's the first section. We're going to be covering all of that. And uh, hopefully we're going to take what to some people think is a difficult subject and, and simplify it. Now, the Bible stories are the key to understanding Bible theology. The Bible stories are there as the key to understanding some of these complex prophetic issues. Revelation, once again, is a kaleidoscope that is pieced together from a lot of other Bible stories. We're going to go back to the beginning. And I want you to just know that in the Garden of Eden, when God first made paradise, everything was good, good, very good. The ground was so lush and vibrant and fertile, it produced just so many exotic fruits that we can't even imagine. And man had to do very little in the way of work. He did work, but it was very pleasant. It wasn't grueling. But then after sin, and man was evicted from the Garden of Eden, God said, and you read this in Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. So something happened. The earth wasn't going to be quite as vibrant and productive. Then you get to Genesis chapter 4. And well, God told Adam in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of your face you will eat bread. Then you go to Genesis 4, and after Cain killed his brother, the curse was even furthered for Cain. It said, when you till the ground, it will henceforth not yield unto thee her strength. And then, of course, even after the flood, the, the earth and the ground and farming became even more difficult because it seems like the natural vitality was diminished. So by the time Israel came on the scene, God told the people of Israel through Moses that they were to farm the land for six years 
and then let it rest on the seventh year. It was like a seven-year Sabbath. And give it a chance to kind of regain its nutrition and you would basically leave it fallow and it would sort of heal itself and develop more vitality and the organic material would build up the soil. You know, I, I know about the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, George Washington Carver became famous because he showed a lot of the plantation growers that they, were just, they weren't able to produce the cotton anymore because cotton took so much nitrogen out of the soil. He said, you've got to plant other things like sweet potatoes and peanuts. And they said, what are we going to do with peanuts? He said, I'll think of something. <laughs> he thought of a lot of things to do with peanuts, including asphalt. He had all kinds of things he invented. But the whole idea was those were crops that would put nitrogen back into the soil and build it up. God knew the ground needed to rest so that it could recover and retain its vitality. Well, for a little while, the Jews followed that law, but as near as we can tell studying Bible history, it was largely forgotten. He told them, the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. The, whatever came up volunteer, the poor were allowed to glean. But they kept harvesting year after year, and they neglected to let the land rest. So God said, look, if you're not going to let the land rest, I will make you let the land rest. Finally, after 490 years of disobedience, they were carried off to Babylon. The Bible tells us that they burnt the house of God. This is the Babylonians burnt the temple of God in Jerusalem. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burnt all the palaces thereof with fire. Notice this, is 2 Chronicles 36, 19. A very important verse. And then that escaped the sword, he carried away to Babylon. Now, don't miss this important point. The people that were in Jerusalem that didn't escape the city, they were destroyed and that city was burnt with fire. Those who were spared and shown mercy were taken off to Babylon to that golden city. Remember, we studied Babylon was like the golden city. And they were able to then come back after the time in Babylon, which was 70 years. It says, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. This is the part I wanted to underscore. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years, or we would say 70 years. So while the land around Jerusalem was desolate, nobody was in the land, it tells us that it was keeping Sabbath. You can read Nehemiah 1, that during that time it says, the walls of Jerusalem also are broken down, the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now when we go to Revelation, and we start reading about this 1,000 years in Revelation. Keep in mind that the Bible says a day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years are like a day. And we know that God works on a principle through the Bible of six days you work and one day you rest. There's going to be a 1,000-year period of time when the planet rests and recovers from the curse of sin. And it is going to be desolate during that time. And so you stay with me, friends, and I think you're going to see how this all fits together and makes perfect sense as we go through it. And I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. It'll be in your lesson. I hope you're using the lessons. You can download them for free. If not, take some notes, and you can look these things up. All right, so we've got question and answer to study the subject of the millennium. Question number one, what events mark the beginning of the 1,000-year period of time? Well, you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And there the Apostle Paul tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ rise first. So the Lord is coming down, and uh, the dead are rising. This is obviously a climatic moment in history. This marks the beginning of the 1,000-year period of time. We just read about this in Revelation chapter 20. It says, they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And it said, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. The dead in Christ rise first. So that's the starting point for when this thousand years begins. The coming of the Lord, the resurrection, those of us who are alive and remain being transformed and caught up to meet the Lord in the air, sometimes called a rapture, but it's not a secret rapture. Everyone's going to know when that happens. The rest of the dead, Revelation 20, verse 5. Now wait. If the dead in Christ rise first, who are the rest of the dead? The wicked. You've only got two choices. Once you've taken the good out of the equation, you've only got the bad. There's only two categories. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. You're saved 
or loss. There are two roads in life. You're on the straight road on the way to heaven, that straight gate, or you're on the broad, and they call it Broadway, you're on the broad road to destruction. So the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are finished, which, what does that imply? After the thousand years are finished, they do live, right? It says this is the first resurrection, meaning those who are raised, the first resurrection when Jesus comes. What else will happen at the first resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52, we will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. You know, I used to wonder what that word incorruptible meant. It means we then have these glorified bodies that do not get old and decay and corrupt, but we've got immortal, eternal, vigorous bodies and we're transformed. And it, it doesn't happen slowly like a butterfly. It happens instantaneously. And the Lord can do that. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. The Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning our regular flesh and blood bodies, they get old. That's not the body that inherits eternal life. But more about that to come. Who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So if we're wondering, what kind of bodies do we have? We've got bodies like the body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Now, he had a glorified body that was, let me back up and say this differently. God made Adam and Eve with real bodies. They were meant to live forever. But they ate and they worked and they were able to uh, rest, not because they were exhausted, but it was a, it's a pleasant rest. And they're real physical bodies. God is going to accomplish his original plan plus an upgrade. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that fourth dimension that we will call the spiritual side of their nature. See, right now, wherever you are and here in the studio, there are angels here. Probably good and bad. There's angels all around. Uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and uh, rulers and heavenly places. And so... Uh, there's a spiritual realm that we don't see. If our eyes could have the veil removed, like the servant of Elisha, we would see the hills are surrounded with chariots of fire. But when man sinned, that sense, that spiritual sense was destroyed or damaged. We're going to have bodies that will be physical and spiritual, but these are glorified immortal bodies that have powers and abilities that we just don't have now. But they're real. When Jesus rose from the dead, he ate he said, touch me, see that flesh and blood doesn't, uh, ha uh, that a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have now. And it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the brightness of his coming and um, the Lord is going to burn up then the wicked and, uh, when he comes. So when Jesus comes, when the resurrection takes place, when we are transformed, we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air with glorified bodies and reunite with the saved who are the dead in Christ. At the same time, what happens to the wicked? This is at the beginning of the 1,000 years. The wicked who are alive, it says they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. You have one group that says, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. And then you got the other group and uh, they flee from his presence, calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and hide them from his face. And then the whole creation sort of implodes at that time when Christ comes. The earth is it's in bad shape. It says, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And notice what else. Every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Now this picture of a hailstone that you see, I understand someone sent this to me yesterday. And it is from Australia. And it looks to me like it's a five pound block of hail. And I know the gentleman and uh, th that's one example. There's some big hailstones. I, I heard that the biggest hail on record was softball sized, but that looks softball sized to me there. And it was in Pakistan and it killed people. You read about the hail, one of the plagues of Egypt. It killed man and beast that were out in the field. But this hail that's coming says every hailstone is the weight of a talent. 
that would be approximately 75 pounds by today's measurement. So you got the earth quaking, mountains are being swallowed up, the dead in Christ are rising, those who are alive are being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the wicked are fleeing from his presence, trying to hide in the surface of the broken earth, being killed by the hailstones that are pummeling from the sky. And at that moment is when the millennium begins. We read in Revelation chapter 20, it says a, an angel. Now this is an angel that's got to be more powerful than Lucifer now. And many suspect this is, might be Gabriel. It's the angel of the Lord. He comes down and he lays hold on the dragon. It calls him the dragon and the serpent. Who is that? Satan. That's Satan. And he's got a great chain in his hand. Now, when we talk about Satan and chains, when we talk about the devil's dungeon, these are kind of metaphors. Uh, I don't think you can handcuff the devil uh, because it says we don't wrestle with uh, flesh and blood. And we don't use carnal weapons in fighting the devil. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual, but they're mighty to bring down those strongholds. He grabs that old serpent that is the devil and Satan, and he binds him for a thousand years. Satan is bound. Where is he bound and how is he bound? And this is where a lot of people misunderstand. I'm going to spend a few moments on this. It says that he's bound in the bottomless pit. That word in Greek is the word abusos. You probably used the word before, the abyss. The same root word. And you, you find that word, for instance, if you read in um, the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament that was translated even before the time of Christ, when it talks about God making the world in the beginning, it says the world, the earth was without form and void. And it says it was abusos. It describes the earth as abusos. If you read in the Bible, when Jesus was talking to the devils, when this demoniac man was possessed there by the Sea of Galilee, he asked him what his name was. And, and they uh, said, our name is Legion, for we are many. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. See that word there, deep? It's exactly the same word that you find in Revelation translated bottomless pit. Now, I remember when I first read this in the Bible, I thought, Satan is cast into a bottomless pit. And, you know, baby Christian, I'm reading the Bible and taking a lot of this stuff literally, and I'm trying to picture a bottomless pit. And I remember going to Carlsbad Caverns when I was younger, and uh, if you've never, anyone here been to Carlsbad Caverns? Yeah, it's really something to see. I wish I could have discovered it. Discovered by a 15-year-old boy named James White, Jim White. And he thought he saw smoke coming up out of the hills. And he got a little closer and it turned out it was a vortex of bats. And there were so many of them that they darkened the sky. And he thought, I got to check this out. Very brave <laughs> young man. Made a barbed wire ladder with some fence posts and barbed wire. Climbed down himself with nothing but you know, a primitive torch, began exploring. He came back several times and ended up being sort of a guardian of Carlsbad Caverns the rest of his life. Well, when they were taking people on the early tours of Carlsbad Caverns, they had kind of a, a walkway they developed to keep people somewhat safe. And they had this one precipice with a big old gaping hole. And I've been there. And they called it the bottomless pit. And the reason is they said, watch this. And they take a stone, they throw a stone over the side and go... I said, it's a bottomless pit. Somewhere, China, it came out the other side or something. I don't know what they thought. Well, after they got equipment that was more sophisticated, they, they climbed down. And I forget what the depth was. It was like, you know, 200, 300 yards down. They found the bottom, which was filled with this very fine limestone dust and a lot of little pebbles. <laughs> because what was happening is the pebbles were going, <whistles> poof. But they didn't hear that. <laughs> and so they thought it was bottomless. Well, of course, bottomless pit, you know, what is that, a black hole? Where is the Lord putting the devil? That is the same word, abusos, that was used to describe the world when it was first created in its chaotic condition. It means the emptiness. These demons that said to Jesus, do not cast us into the abusos. It means the emptiness with nothing to possess. See, even in the time of Christ, it says it was there because they said, don't cast us there. See, the devil's a workaholic. If he has nothing to do, it drives him crazy. Well, he's probably already crazy, but it really makes it difficult for him. And the way that the devil and the demons manifest themselves is not by, you know, haunting houses. I mean, what devil wants to get excited about possessing a two-by-four? 
It's not, that's not what excites them. What excites them is manipulating people and animals, living creatures. And when they are cast out and they have nothing to possess, they even said to Jesus, don't cast us out of the man into the buzos. Let us go into the pigs. At least they're alive. We can do something with them. And so uh, yeah, Jesus actually let them go into the pigs and they all ran off the cliff. So Satan, when he is bound in the bottomless pit, he is bound on this world with nobody to tempt or manipulate for a thousand years. Now think about it. This all makes sense. Where are the dead in Christ when Jesus comes? What direction do they go? They go up. What about the dead who are wicked? What happens to them when Jesus comes? They're staying dead. There's no resurrection for them. It says the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. Um, and the living in Christ, where do they go? They go up. The wicked who are living when Jesus comes, what happens? Destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So how many people are alive on earth when Jesus comes? After he comes, I should say. Nobody. So what has the devil got to do? You know, the Bible says that when Christ comes, the heavens depart as a scroll. The sun goes dark, the moon turns to blood, so the planet is cold. It's not going to be global warming. It's going to be global freezing. The planet is cold and dark and desolate, and it's covered with destruction. Let's just take a minute here and look at some of the verses that deal with this. Question three, who will be raised in the second resurrection, and when will that take place? The rest of the dead, we've discovered they're who? They're the wicked. They don't live again until the thousand years were finished. Which means at the end of the thousand years, they do come out of the graves. It says, they that are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good, the resurrection of life. Now notice, Jesus says there's two resurrections. This is, by the way, John 5, 28 and 29. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. It's going to be like the zombie apocalypse at the end of 1,000 years. All of them are going to come out of the graves. And someone says, well, Pastor Doug, it's pretty clear that when Jesus comes, the righteous get immortal glorified bodies. But if the wicked, when they're raised at the end of the 1,000 years, you know, they may have been in pretty bad shape. What kind of bodies do they get? Not exactly sure, but I just suspect God's going to put them back together enough so they know what's going on. And if you come out of the grave and your back still hurts, that doesn't bode well. You're probably not in the right resurrection <laughs> You're, you're going to have uh, the old body, is what that would mean. So what is the condition of the earth? What condition will it be left in during this thousand-year Sabbath, when the earth is resting? It's desolate, the Bible says, after the devastating earthquake and the hailstorm that begin the 1,000 years. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turns it upside down. The earth is utterly broken down. Now, Isaiah, is he talking about something in the past or is he looking into the future? Notice, he's talking about what the earth is going to look like during the millennium in the future. I beheld the earth, Jeremiah 4.23. Now, when you first read this, you're going to think you're in Genesis. I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. Sound familiar? But keep reading. And the heavens and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and there was no man, and the birds of heaven were fled. And the picture is they were once there, but they're gone now. I beheld on the fruitful place was a wilderness, a place that was once fruitful is now a wilderness, and all the cities are broken down. It's not talking about Genesis. All the cities are broken down. Why? At the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. The Lord says he will come and he'll make an end, but not a complete end. So here, Jeremiah is describing a time, a condition, when the, the world is empty. All the cities are broken down. There is no man on the earth. Let me give you more verses. I know this is new for some people. The slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even to the other. They will not be lamented or gathered or buried. You know, typically after a battle when there's a lot of slain, some family or some agency comes in and they take care of the bodies and they bury them out of sight to, so life can go on. But here it says there'll be a day. I know it's not a pretty picture. But there's going to be a day when the slain of the, or, of the Lord cover the earth from one end to the other, no one to lament, mourn, or bury. By the way, I, I didn't 
put any slides in on this, but you read in Revelation 19, it talks about the Lord calls all the birds of carrion, the eagles and the vultures to the feast. And it's, a, it's they're talking about the feast of the carrion. And it's describing a time, often after battles, when the slain would cover the fields, the sky would grow dark with those birds of carrion. They often talk about this. You remember what um, Goliath said to David? He said, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed you to the buzzards. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, David basically said, no, it's going to be the other way around. <laughs> but that was a common sight. The sky would grow dark with all of the, the birds of carrion. And here it's saying the whole earth is covered. And it says, the Lord says, come to the birds and eat the flesh of captains and great men and mighty men because the whole earth is covered with the slain at that point. They're not lamented, gathered, or buried. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years and what will they be doing? Jesus said, I will come again. Let me back up. You all know this in John 14, verse 3. It says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I love this promise, I will come again. He promised that. He's going to keep his word. I think it's very soon, by the way. I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you might be also. Now I just need to pause. Take a breath and explain why this is such an important issue. There are uh, two competing views on the millennium that do not, you can't reconcile them. One group, and this is, it's a fairly new theology, meaning in the last 150 years or so, they believe that the millennium is going to be spent here on earth, that what will happen is the rapture will be a secret. The church is caught away, but life continues to go on here on earth during those seven years of tribulation. Then after the seven years of tribulation, then Jesus comes back with the saints. And then the saints are here on earth ruling over the wicked for 1,000 years. And I would not want that. I don't know who would ever think that'd be good to rule over the wicked. Satan is somehow bound, so I guess it's not as bad. But we've got glorified bodies, but the wicked don't. So I guess they keep having funerals, but we don't. It just doesn't seem to make sense. And in that scenario, this is the left behind Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye scenario. And you know, I don't question the sincerity of these men. I just respectfully disagree because in their scheme of last day prophecy, they've always got someone alive on earth. They don't have a place for all these verses that say that the earth is, is desolate, that it's resting. And Jesus said, what direction do we go when he comes? He says, I go, I'll come receive you unto myself that you may be at the mansions he's prepared, the place I've gone to be. And so we clearly go up when Jesus comes. It says when Jesus comes, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The slain of the Lord covered the earth. You, you can't reconcile those two ideas. So we do not spend the millennium on earth. We spend it in heaven. Watch us each week as we share the word of God that will change your life. We also welcome you to view our website, amazingfactsministries.com where you can donate online, or you can view our resource catalog, or watch our weekly video broadcasts.